surface water, it's less than 1% of um, the 3%, and uh, the rest is groundwater, and not all of that is necessarily available. That's still a lot of water. If you took that water and divided it by the population, um, you'd actually have plenty of water per person on the planet. But the problem is, of course, that's, that's the wrong calculation, and it has it's kind of a meaningless calculation, and in fact, we have tremendous water scarcity. You can show this uh, very interesting figure yesterday. We have tremendous water scarcity across the globe. Um, and so what it, basically what we have is people living in places where there isn't enough water. It has to do with where the water is and where the people are, and how we use the water where we do have people. So you can see there's water scarcity in North America. You can see it in just about um, many, many of the continents. And the gray areas don't be fooled. It just means there's no formal data to use this kind of graphic. There's plenty of water, water scarcity in other parts of those gray areas as well. Now, as a result of this, we have um, one of the biggest problems our globe faces is lack of access to safe drinking water and to sanitation. And this, is, this sounds so simple. It is a huge problem. I, I would submit that it's in the top three facing every citizen, every person born in this world. And, um, and yet, we have yet to fix this problem. So over a billion people do not have access to safe drinking water. Somewhere between 2.4 and 2.6 billion don't have access to sanitation. And 2 million people die every year due to diarrheal disease. That's just, that's direct water related. There's indirect water related that I've not included here. So millions and millions of people die every year. That translates to one child dying every 15 seconds due to water related disease. Now we have the Millennium Goals to fix this. They were put in place in the early 2000s, and 2000, I guess, uh, directly. And they, they said, goal seven, by 2015, we will half the proportion of people without access to safe drinking water and sanitation. We are actually on track to meet the goal for drinking water. It's very, uh, it's not across the globe, it's four specific regions, but hey, we'll take, we'll take wins where we can. But we're really, we're really um, losing out on the sanitation goal. In fact, it's gotten worse. We're adding numbers of people without access to adequate sanitation. And that's why the death toll continues to rise, and that's because sanitation is driving that death toll more than the drinking water issue. In fact, um, Peter Glick did this really interesting modeling of how many people would die cumulatively over a 20-year period, um, including the Millennium Goals, and if we achieved them or if we didn't. And somewhere between 30 and 70 mil billion, million, million people are expected to have died cumulatively over the time frame of the Millennium Goals. So um, this is a severe, severe problem facing society. Now let's look at a couple of examples. So I recently read this article on China that just disturbed me terribly. I mentioned it to the students yesterday because I'm, I'm disturbed about this issue. And uh, in China, they have tremendous water stress. So they're 20% of the world's population. They have 7% of the world's water. All right, so they're water poor. And um, they have managed to get by by uh, using the Three Gorges Dam to control and manage the Yangtze River. Now, northern China has much less water than southern China. But northern China is where the people are. There's, there's um, more than half the population lives in northern China, but very little of the water is up there. And all the agriculture is up there. That part I don't really get, but that's where they grow their food is in the water poor region of the country. As a result, they need more water. In fact, in Beijing, uh, they have um, uh, they have one tenth per person of the water that the UN recommends for daily living. All of Beijing. So they are definitely being stressed for not having enough water. What they've done is they've designed. If you thought that the Three Gorges Dam was one of the biggest projects ever, they've they have proposed and are building, as we speak, the biggest water project in the history of the planet. And it is called the South North Water Project, and it's shown in red. Um, so here's the Yellow River. Here's the Yangtze and the Three Gorges. Now we're talking about moving water from the southern part of China to the northern part. They're going to move it by canal and connecting those rivers. 2,000 miles of canals and channels and water movement all to get another 7% of their water supply in the north. That's it, $50 billion for 7% water supply. The um, water is, uh, there's one thing is to have enough water. Then there's the whole issue of quality. You can have all the water you want, if it's not clean, you don't have water. So 
The other issue they have is that 70% of the groundwater in northern China is unfit for human contact. They have deaths all the time, people floating down rivers because they touched the rivers. <laughs> Unbelievable. 70% of the groundwater is unusable. 30% of the water that's going to be moved up there is unfit for agriculture. They, you know, they want it for irrigation. They can't use it for irrigation. It's too dirty. So they have to clean the water to use it. It's unbelievable. They think that they spend 2.3% of their GDP annually on water-related health issues. So China, this is a, uh, it's not a poster child, it's big, it's 20% of the world's population. It's a, it's a huge problem, but China is embodying a big problem right now, if you want to see it. That, by the way, is a fish kill over there. All right, I'm going to move to the United States now. Now, we have our own problems. We certainly have drought. This is the most current, um, actually, that will come out again this morning or yesterday morning, the U.S. Drought Monitor every week puts out these maps that show drought across the United States. We've seen it much worse, of course. Last summer, this was a much worse map. Uh, but it still is pretty impressively bad. All that yellow and orange and uh, red they are areas of some kind of drought. The L and the S stand for short-term drought, and the L stands for long-term drought. Um, so you can see that about a third of the nation is under pretty severe water stress. And that's, that's here in this country. Another example in the United States, of course, is the Colorado River Basin. The uh, uh, Lake Mead that is, was created by the Hoover Dam is down 40%. It's at, at its lowest level in history. The water intake for Las Vegas is about to be uncovered, so Las Vegas won't have one of their water intakes. So they're in a panic. They're drilling another water intake down below, but they're having trouble with that. It's caving in on them and a lot of problems there. So we see tremendous, so we're, we're near a crisis in parts of the United States. Texas is certainly struggling, but the entire Colorado River Basin is definitely struggling. Uh, California was going to fix their problem by building the biggest desalinization plant in the nation. Actually, might have been in the world. And suddenly, last week, the, the, the contractor said, you know, I don't think we can actually do this. And they pulled out. <laughs> so California, Southern California, is kind of going, oops, wonder what we're going to do. So. Um, a bit of, you know, there's, crisis, there's places of crisis around the United States. In fact, Los Angeles is kind of interesting, or California in general. This is a recent California water atlas that the government of California said, you know, let's really find out where our water is and how much is being taken out, and let's make it interactive in GIS, and you can go online and play with this map. It's very interesting. Every one of those wells, those are withdrawal wells, over dot. It's not a Monet painting. It is a <laughs> series of well withdrawals. And um, you can, it's both alarming and beautiful at the same time. You know, it's very pretty to look at. It looks like Christmas decorations. However, every one of those is, is a withdrawal. The gray are municipal. The green are, you might imagine, irrigation. And the brown and beige are livestock. There's a lot of livestock wells in California. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. So pretty much there's no space left in California. It's all been drilled. So. Now, I'm gonna, I use Minnesota quite a bit as an example. But um, one of the examples of Minnesota that makes it such an interesting story is it is, it's the land of 10,000 lakes. It's on our license plate. Um, actually, it's 12,000 lakes over an acre in size. We have um, or 100 acres or something like that. There's a, there's a lot of water. Everything that's blue on that map is water. We have a lot of water. We have the most surface water of all the 48 lower states in any other state. We have all sorts of records around our water. We're very proud of our water. Um, and so we have water everywhere. But is it going to be enough as things change? This particular map indicates what's going to change in terms of demographics and population. <laughs> so we know the brown is where people are going to move over the next 30 years. We're going to add a million people to our five and a half million people that we already have in the next 30 years. And we're going to move to those areas that have the Twin Cities, by the way, the brown area, or the Lake District. You know, second homes, all these people retiring. That's in the middle of the state there. But um, the population is definitely going to increase over this time frame, and it's going to get older. So the demographic is going to be for a higher percentage of people over 60 than um, any other population range. So um, it's going to change in Minnesota, and we need to be planning for that. We don't know if we're going to have enough water. If we add another million people, will we ever run out of water? But again, a bigger problem is we might have lots of water, but if it isn't clean, it's not enough water. So the other question is, will it be clean enough? Minnesota is just like the nation. We mimic the nation. 
40% of our water, our surface waters, do not meet federal water quality standards. So the word impairment is a legal term that means that that body of water does not meet federal water quality standards under the Clean Water Act. So 40% of our waters in Minnesota are out of compliance with federal law. It's a big deal. 40% of the nation's waters are out of compliance with federal law. For Minnesota, every bit of yellow and red on that map is where we have impaired waters. So we have a lot to do in Minnesota to clean up our, our famous lakes and rivers. So to address this, we have to really plan for the future. So in order to deal with, do we, to answer those questions, do we have enough water, is it clean enough, you really have to get at how are you going to define sustainability and how are you going to then implement it and operationalize it. It's one thing to talk about lofty sustainability goals, it's another to say how the heck are we going to get there. So the state of Minnesota, um, in one of its moments of great wisdom, um, it has them occasionally, um, it passed a law, put into statute the definition of water sustainable use. And it does not harm, it's when you do not harm ecosystems, degrade water quality, or compromise the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This is in statute. They have ecosystem needs in the statute. It's great. <laughs> I mean, it really says it's not about people, it's about everybody. It's, it's great. And they certainly, in other parts of statute, they, they, they acknowledge that it's not just about the environment. You have to have healthy communities, you have to have a healthy economy, as well as a healthy environment. They're all interrelated. So um, we're lucky, we actually have this in statute, we don't have to argue about what sustainable use is. But it's not very quantitative. So the legislature came to the university and said, could you come up with a 25 year plan of how to become sustainable? We're not sustainable now, how do we get there? So um, what I'll be talking about are some of those recommendations and solutions that we came up with uh, uh, using about 250 really, really smart water people from around the state to, um, to answer the question, how do you achieve sustainable water use? Our solutions, and I put them in general terms, our solutions are not Minnesota specific in any way, shape, or form. I believe these solutions could be applied to the entire country. Now, let's talk about the entire country's water use, because how water is used has everything to do with the problems that we create or the solutions that we come up with. So in the United States, and the 2010 data still have not been released, uh, probably because of government shutdowns and whatnot, so we don't have the 2010 data yet. But um, you can see the general trend. Most of our water goes to thermal electric power. It's cooling water. The thermal electric power, that's the yellow bar, the tall bar. The next tallest bar is green, and that's the irrigation. So nationally, we use water for cooling. That's non-consumptive use for the most part. Once through cooling water. And then we have irrigation water, which of course is consumptive. So the biggest consumptive use is irrigation. And then uh, municipal supply, rural, domestic, and uh, livestock you know, all fall in these other categories. So those are the, the, the big uses within the nation. Also notice that since about 1980, it's leveled off. Our consumption of water has been balanced, um, or I should say the growth in population has been balanced by better use of water. So, um, it's, it's interesting to see that it's leveled off so, uh, so well. In Minnesota, we don't see that it's leveled off. We're, the, we're one state where that curve keeps going up. But uh, I think because we take water for granted, because we're so water rich. But in the nation, this is kind of the snapshot of how the nation uses water. All right. Now, what are the issues that, that result as a, from those kinds of water uses and from the policies that we've had in place up to now? And these, again, these are national issues I've done on three panels which have said, what are the big national issues? So you'll see that, that this is those issues. But they also held in Minnesota. The same issues in Minnesota hold for the whole nation. I'm guessing they hold for um, Michigan uh, just as much. Having enough water of enough uh, sufficient quality, problems with eutrophication, problems with contaminants of emerging concern. I heard this mentioned several times last night at the reception. Um, the connection of water with other media, such as air and land use, um, protecting our aquatic ecosystems, I should say the degradation of our aquatic ecosystems is an issue, and how we move the water around on the land, the hydrologic issues. The water energy nexus, of course all that cooling water is, a, is an energy use of water. Economic issues, and of course social and governance issues. All of those come into play as contributing to the, why we don't have sustainable water use in the United States. Now, um, there are many things that influence water management or water resources that are out of our control, in a sense. Some of these we kind of control, but not too much. 
So demographics, we don't control our population here, and that's probably, you know, that's okay. We accept that as a society, but as population changes, <coughs> it has an influence on water resource, uh, the quality and quantity of water resources. How we use the land, climate change is of course a huge one, which we are not controlling in any way, shape, or form, and then how we use energy. These are all interrelated. As our population grows, they need more energy. As our population grows, they change how they use the land. As the climate uh, warms, we need more energy for cooling. All of these things are interrelated. If you add the water issues, they are all related to those drivers, or driven by those drivers, and they're related to each other. And they're also influenced by economic and social choices and conditions. My point being that it's not a list of issues that we have to address, it's a system. I'm probably pre preaching to the choir. It's all about systems. This is a system, but when I talk to the legislature, they want to like say, okay, which, well, give me the list. I said, no, no, it's a system. <laughs> so that's my system preaching for now. Now in Minnesota, we use groundwater. Um, I'm gonna talk about groundwater first because that first issue is sufficient water. In Minnesota, we have sufficient surface water. We don't have sufficient groundwater, or maybe we do, we don't know. That's kind of the big question. So let's talk about groundwater. We do we use groundwater a little differently than the rest of the country. Uh, this shows our groundwater use over time from 1980s, uh, 1990 roughly, up to, up to the present. And um, our irrigation used to be very low. It used to be less than 10% of our water use. But our permits have skyrocketed. They've gone up exponentially as the price of corn has gone up. Uh, dramatically, we are we're planting more and more corn and irrigating more and more corn as uh, an insurance policy. So the irrigation permits have gone way up. And you can see that in the green, like the green part of that uh, curve is the irrigation use in Minnesota. So that's that's um, that's gone up, um, considerably, and the, the expectation is it will continue to. There's really no end in sight of the the uh, interest in irrigation in the state. Um, we also are changing where we get our drinking water from. And th these data surprised everybody. Nobody had been paying attention. And suddenly somebody put it all together and said, let's plot how much groundwater versus surface water we're using in the Twin Cities, which, by the way, is where three quarters of the state lives. So if you want to know what's going on in the state in terms of numbers, the Twin Cities is a good place to look. The metro area is a seven county area around the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minneapolis. Well, we used to do surface water back in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s, we drank Mississippi River water right from the Twin Cities, right? So that's what we would use is, is Mississippi River water. Now we're drinking more and more groundwater. And now, in fact, most of the water being used in the Twin Cities is groundwater. That's because we've expanded out away from the Twin Cities, excuse me, away from the Mississippi River, and it's easier to drink the well and to pipe water from the Mississippi River. So this is an interesting trend, but this is causing concerns. Can we, can we really do this? Can we just keep expanding and growing and not paying attention and drilling wells? One of the reasons we paid attention to this is we have a very prominent lake in a very wealthy section of the Twin Cities that has dropped eight feet in three years. <laughs> and it's, it's a groundwater-fed lake. And it's the pumping of groundwater has made this lake a sense of good ride. Property owners are going crazy. Their docks are out of water. They can't use it. It's a mess. And these are wealthy people. So they went to the legislature and complained. So there's been study after study. But if ever you needed a poster child for people to understand the connection of groundwater and surface water, wow, we've got it. We have White Bear Lake. And it's, I show it in most talks, at least in Minnesota, because everyone's heard about White Bear Lake. So we're, we're very conscious of groundwater. This is why. <laughs> this is a typical hydrograph uh, from an observation well in the west part of the Twin Cities. And so over a 60-year period, uh, the drawdown has been 40 feet. Nice and steady. <laughs> no ups and downs. That's summer and winter, but boom. All the hydrographs in the Twin Cities that we have in observation wells, they look like this. You know, the, the slope changes, but whoa, this is, this is alarming. <laughs> this is not sustainable water use. So the Met Council, which oversees the uh, water management for the metropolitan area, they um, have done some fairly, very sophisticated modeling. This is hot off the press, and this is their best, their best modeling using uh, U of M folks and uh, University of Minnesota. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Um, 
And they basically looked to the future. They modeled um, up to 2030 water use. And the, uh, the main aquifer, which is the Prairie du Chien Jordan aquifer, is beneath the Twin Cities. And what would that look like? So that this is a, a dynamic, sophisticated model. And uh, you can see those red areas are where the drawdown exceeds 50% of what's available, the severe drawdown. And then the blue is pretty bad. <laughs> so we're talking tens of feet of drawdown. So um, this, is, this is definitely a, co a cause of concern. They, they really need to think about conjunctive use. They need to think about going back to surface water. But this is not a sustainable use of water. So OK, that's the first big issue. What do we do about it? Okay? Well, one of the first things that we said to the state was determine the water balance. Do that modeling for the rest of the state. They just did the modeling this year. We've been beating this drum for years, saying, you know how much water you're pulling out. You don't know how much water is going back. The recharge rates are very complicated. It's a seven aquifer layer system. We don't know the recharge rates or the exchange rates. And uh, so it's like a bank account where you, you spend, 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 and you have no idea what you're depositing not very wise uh, finance. And so our water finances can't be managed well if we don't understand this water balance. And this is true across the country. I go to my colleagues around the country and I say, do you, do you guys have, you know how much water you have and how it moves? No. <laughs> Whoa. So um, this is important. Also, I'm, I'm mentioning the permit issue. It's kind of a small issue, but our permit system was extremely archaic. We just gave permits. You can withdraw water here, have a permit. <laughs> go drill, fine. And we're running into problems with that. And so um, the DNR, which is our uh, agency that is responsible for appropriations of water, um, is redoing its permit system as a result of us pushing them to do so. And they're um, actually, it's based on the Michigan uh, permit system. We're borrowing a whole lot of Michigan's permit system. So I wanted to give you credit for the work that's been done um, here in Michigan on that. All right, second issue, excess nutrients. They are the major driver of our impaired waters. I'm guessing they also are in the state. They are a result of a, a number of different uses of the land. Um, we care about phosphorus for eutrophication. For the most part, we care about nitrogen on our coastal waters uh, in other states. But we also care about nitrates in, in our drinking water because of public health issues. And if you look, certainly in the middle third of the country, this is where the nitrogen and phosphorus come from. So this is the, the, the upper, I'm not even the upper, this is the Midwest. These are USGS figures from the, basically the Mississippi River Basin from north to south. So a third of the country. So most of the phosphorus and nitrogen is coming from agricultural practice. Mostly row crop, addition of fertilizers. Um, and uh, in, phosphor, in the case of phosphorus, there are other sources that are now being regulated, such as urban stormwater. But um, we have regulated uh, most of these sources. Um, for, this is an unregulated source, and in, in terms of nitrogen, almost 80% of it is uh, the, the addition of that nitrogen is unregulated. That sector of our economy, agriculture, row crop agriculture, is not regulated for these kinds of pollutants. As a result, Minnesota, <laughs> and I bet you have the same data, these are wells, recent wells, that have been uh, put in the state, both public, uh, for public water supply and private wells that have allowed us to sample them. The red dots indicate where we exceed the health standard. That's above 10 milligrams per liter. It's unbelievable to me that we have that many wells in the state that are that, uh, that contaminated. So that's a lot of non-compliance with public health standards. This is the same data for surfaces for surface water. So these are our lakes and rivers. You see the red dots, again, above the health standard are in the southern part of the state. That's where most of our agriculture is, so that makes sense. And it's also where our shallowest aquifers are, so it also makes sense. That's our most vulnerable part of our geology. So we have a problem. So what are we going to do about it? Well, for one thing, we've recommended to the state that they develop watershed scale nutrient management plans. Manage phosphorus from all sources all at once on a watershed scale. Don't just pass a law that regulates black grass clippings and then regulates phosphorus and detergents and then over here. Phosphorus doesn't care where it came from. It causes eutrophication. So manage it comprehensively in an integrated way. We are starting to do that. But that's, that's hard. It sounds really easy. The second thing, this, these are our most controversial recommendations. The legislature hasn't paid one iota of attention to them. I'll just say that. Everything else they kind of listen to and they're implementing. These two, they don't like these at all. They get in the way with politics. So, as uh, who is familiar with TMDLs? Okay. 
Okay, some of you. All right, so TMDLs are the, uh, the process by which under the Clean Water Act, if you have an impaired water, you have to do a study to figure out how much you have to reduce your sources to meet water quality standards. So you back calculate how much you have to reduce those sources. So that's required by the Clean Water Act. Every state has to do them. Um, nobody is required to do them. Okay? So it's a study that says how much you should reduce your sources, but nobody requires implementation of the study. It's a little checkbox that you did a study, EPA is happy, that's all that happens. So we said, okay, require them to be implemented. Now, how do you do that if the agricultural sector isn't regulated? How do you make them do their source reduction? So our third bullet is make them be part of the solution, regulate them. Regulate them in that we have a very creative way of how that would happen, not as a point source, not in the usual permit way, but basically bring them to the table in, in uh, farmer-led, performance-based uh, standards. They have to basically meet the same regulatory standard as everybody else. They're the unregulated community, and that's not fair to the regulated community. Right now, all the reductions and pollutants are being done by wastewater treatment plants and cities. These are, um, as I said, this has fallen on, not deaf ears. <laughs> oh no, they're quite scared of these two recommendations, but um, I wouldn't say they've had any traction. Um, however, um, there is movement nationally to talk about how to make this happen. They don't want to do regulation. They really, really want uh, voluntary programs and incentives to, to drive the cleanup of eutrophication. And uh, frankly, the work in Minnesota so far indicates that that will simply won't, won't cure the problem. So we, I feel we need stronger approaches. You know, I, I argue with people all the time about this approach. It's very top-down. The regulatory hammer can be quite heavy. But uh, I don't think we can get there any other way without some kind of regulatory limit and allowing the farmer to figure out how to meet it. Enough said on that. Contaminants of emerging concern. You all have, um, uh, you're well aware of this. I heard it mentioned at several points last night uh, at the uh, reception by uh, the new faculty members. Essentially, these are uh, another set of contaminants that aren't regulated, so we don't include them in the Clean Water Act or in the Safety Clean Water Act. And um, instead of just kind of the top five conventional pollutants that cause problems, there are hundreds of these. The best guess is somewhere between 400 and 600 compounds are a potential risk that are found in the environment. We know them as endocrine disruptors, we know them as pharmaceuticals, we know them by a number of names, but contaminants of emerging concern is a nice catch-all for all these things. And we know that they're found throughout the nation, certainly, they're found throughout the industrialized world in uh, both groundwater and surface water. So they come from food containers, they come from cosmetics, they come from additives and all the soaps and detergents that we use at home and our personal care products, the shampoo I use this morning. Uh, we dispose of drugs and that gets into the water supply. Uh, we have direct discharges in some cases. And then we have agricultural inputs. Some of our current use uh, herbicides are um, endocrine disruptors. And we also know that the livestock, of course, uses lots of um, pharmaceuticals as well. And they're, they're regulated differently than uh, the FDA regulates human uh, drugs. So we have many sources. They're very diffuse. Consequently, they're a tough thing to and get, a, get your arms around because it's not one source that you can manage. And we should be concerned because they have, we know this, okay? These are known facts. They affect reproduction. They affect growth. They affect development. They affect organs. They affect other things that are related to the, these epidemics of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. We know they are related to behavioral changes in children and of most concern. The mom can be exposed and have none of those effects, be perfectly healthy. Her daughter will grow up and have a disease caused by, when she's 30 or 40, her disease will have been caused by her mother's exposure. So these things are transgenerational and they're, um, they're delayed disease outcomes in the next generation. They don't happen at birth necessarily, they can happen after puberty. So very concerning. Um, a study by the USGS shows that uh, uh, nine pharmaceuticals and two other compounds are found routinely in drinking water throughout the nation. And um, another study by the USGS found that in fish collected uh, down at the major collection points of the major river basins throughout the nation, 31% of those sites had fish that had intersex, which means they have both ovary and gonadal tissue. They're sterile, they're hopelessly mangled, they can't reproduce. 
and 31%. The background rate is 2%. So we have managed to screw up <laughs> our drinking water supply and our um, nation's fishery. What are we going to do about these? Well, it's tough. Um, we have to work at green chemistry. We have to work to get these contaminants out of our um, manufacturing uh, chains. We have to come up with better substitutions and not use toxic chemicals to make our makeup and hair and shampoo. I mean, that's just kind of silly. Let's get rid of those chemicals and use other chemicals if we need to. So green manufacturing, to incentivize that, to make sure that we have um, uh, support to our industry to really find a different way to, um, a different path to follow would be great. So move upstream and get rid of these things at the manufacturing end. We already have these things in our water and in our fish and in our bodies, and so what do we do about that? Well, you can remove them. There are technologies to remove them. They're hugely expensive on large scale. They're hugely energy intensive. So that's one way to go, but it's not, you can't clean all the water in the United States that way. So we need new, cheaper technologies that are going to selectively remove the most harmful of these contaminants. The next issue is how we use the land and how that affects water. This is a huge category, but kind of a no-brainer. We manage water at one scale. Maybe it's the county scale, maybe it's the state scale, federal scale. We manage land at the township scale, the city scale, zoning commissions. We we'll pay no attention to water. And the water planners don't really know much about land. <coughs> so we have different scales, different people, different expertise, planning, 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 and not talking to one another. The counties in Minnesota, there are two that have embraced joint land and water planning at the county level, have done wonderfully. And they are a model, I think, for how we could all move forward with much better planning. This is a simple solution. <laughs> just go do it. It's not expensive. It's just common sense. Uh, the issues of uh, protecting our ecosystems, and um, that of, uh, often relates to where the water goes. If you drain a wetland, that's hydrologic integrity, but it also affects ecological integrity. So we put these two issues together because they're very related. And um, how do you go about making sure that, I mean, you can't go back to 1850 and <laughs> take out all the tile drains and fill all of them, you know, re-put in all the wetlands and tear down all the buildings that have happened. Um, so you really have to think about how to move forward in a smart way. So protecting priority habitat is very, very important, and figuring out where the priority habitat is. We have models that will do that. Use those to set aside land to protect that habitat and those species and those, those, uh, that biodiversity. Um, aquatic species. I was thrilled to hear last night, so one of your new faculty, Chloe? One of your new faculty is, is modeling invasive species. Oh, fantastic. This is, this is what's needed. State governments all need to, to take her models and, and run with them, literally, um, so that we're not playing, you know, cleaning up after the fact, chasing the, you know, the, the latest invasive species after it's invaded and costing money to, to manage. Uh, climate adaptation. We're not going to change the climate. We're going to have to adapt to it in the short term and the long term. <coughs> Our natural resources are, are going to be hugely affected. Again, there was talk of this, I believe, Pedro, you were talking about this as well. So the need to come up with these strategies, and these are, these are community strategies. How are communities going to become resilient to climate change issues and their water supply and their land use, et cetera? Um, we're not going to tear out our tile drains in Minnesota, and you're not, and Iowa isn't, and Illinois isn't. But you know what? We do have better drainage techniques, and so we basically are advocating for requiring those new 21st century drainage techniques control drainage to control the flow of water um, instead of having these big torrents come through um, whenever, the, you know, just having open pipes. We'll have control drainage require it in our, our farming communities and then protect marginal lands. So this means don't plant corn on a land that's got a 20% slope line. The water energy nexus is another big issue. Not many people really have connected with this one as much um, until they really get that how connected it is. So I've talked about cooling water. It's the biggest use of water in the nation, is to produce electricity. Now that's a big connection. <laughs> we also need energy to clean our water. We use water, lots of water, to make ethanol. In Minnesota, it's about four gallons of water per gallon of ethanol. Uh, it's more in water poor states. It's because we don't irrigate as much as other states. Um, and of course, cooling water, as I already mentioned. But how many kilojoules it takes to clean a gallon of water? Believe it or not, most people don't know that. The utilities don't know that. 
how much, uh, like I said, how much water it takes to make ethanol. Studies have been done uh, so that we kind of know that, but that's actually a really small part of our energy equation. Um, how much water we use for cooling to produce how much energy? Quantitatively, this is not known. <coughs> the Congressional Research Service just issued yet another report saying, we don't know. No state keeps records. Nobody keeps track of this. We don't know. Somebody should figure this out. So our recommendation to our state was figure it out. Start keeping records. <laughs> you can figure it out. You just have to go to a lot of facilities and ask a lot of questions. Now, um, an economic issue is how to pay for infrastructure into the future. This is a huge issue, and it's a huge dollar sign issue. Our infrastructure is now 50, well, 90 to 50 years old. And we adopted the Clean Water Act and sanitation practices early in the uh, 20th century. And those plants are all decaying. We're growing. We need new plants. We need upgrades. And guess what? <laughs> There's no money to pay for them. So the cost of these plants in Minnesota is the blue line. And what we have available through grants and revolving fund money from the feds is the green line. And that nice little curve there is the gap that nobody has money for. And it's a lot of money. Multiply that by about 25, and that's the needs for the country. The needs for the country are in the hundreds of billions of dollars to replace, manage, upgrade, maintain existing water infrastructure. This is a train wreck, because they're all going to come due at the same time. Our plants are still kind of rolling along, but those water treatment plants that were put in in the 1920s, they're all getting old. <laughs> they can't last much longer. So this is a huge, huge issue across the nation. We're not going to go back to outhouses. We're not going to go back to buckets of water. So somebody's going to have to pay for this. We have to figure that out. And uh, nobody in the country, except for isolated pockets, some municipalities have figured this out. But for the most part, everyone's kind of hoping a money tree will shake loose. <coughs> uh, finally, there are social and economic changes that are necessary to uh, manage water sustainably. This may be the most important and the hardest to understand, and the hardest for policymakers and decision makers to get their hands around because they kind of want to fix it with the science. The science is hugely important. But ultimately, it's the decision makers that decide sustainable water use policy. And so, first off, you have to have this ethic of responsibility. You can't just be, oh, that person's going to be in charge. Like with, with the infrastructure costs. Nobody's taking responsibility for the, the future infra infrastructure costs. We have to know where our water comes from and goes. I always start every class, first of the semester, first class of the semester, and say, do you know where your water comes from? And they go, well, oh, <laughs> so try again. <laughs> we go, Mississippi River. I go, there's 500 wells uh, 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 intake from the Mississippi. Which one? They go, what? <laughs> I said, where does your water go? And we boil it. I said, and? <laughs> so it's amazing. And I'll ask you guys the same question, but uh, you can answer silently. <laughs> uh, we do not pay for water adequately at all. Not just the infrastructure needs, we do not pay for what the true cost of water is when you talk about lost ecological services as a result of putting in a well, putting in a reservoir. We don't pay for any of that. And we don't have conservation pricing in most of the country. Uh, we needed a, an effective policy framework that covers all these issues and, and it takes into account all the unintended consequences. And the legislators say to me, let's put um, uh, activated carbon on all the drinking water systems in the entire state. We'll fund it. We'll just do it. I said, cool idea, except you don't have enough money, and you really don't have enough energy. You'll have to build like five different power plants, and that would put a lot of mercury into the air, which would get into the fish, which would, not a good idea. She went, oh, oh my god, it's connected. <laughs> Light bulb, yay. <laughs> you have to educate folks. We have a whole <coughs> series of workshops with our legislature on uh, water 101, uh, policy analysis, how to <coughs> look at policies and analyze them and pick the right policy for the state. Um, we're doing lots of work on that arena, um, and make sure that the ecosystem value of water is, is always considered throughout. And then finally, align all our policies with sustainability. If you have a water sustainability policy, but your energy policy is contradictory to that, that's, obviously you're going to still have problems. So I'm going to stop there with, uh, with my um, list of issues, but hopefully also a list of potential solutions for those issues and leave you with uh, the imagined future. Thank you very much. And I think there's time for questions. Yes. Uh, 
in the case of your uh, the Minnesota statute that was uh, entered, is is there there's no legal uh, avenue to uh, activate that or to uh, implement it? Um, there are, because once that statute was in place, it's also peppered throughout a bunch of other statutes that are authorizing statutes. So, for instance, the DNR is now developing rules as a result of those statutes, rules to um, define sustainability standards for groundwater withdrawals that are based on surface water characteristics and ecosystem protection. So they determine the necessary ecosystem flows at the surface, and they're going to figure out somehow <laughs> um, what the groundwater flows could be uh, to support those ecosystem services at the surface. And those are will be called their sustainability standards. So that the, the commissioner probably wouldn't have done that without that yeah. statute forcing it. And, and, and is, in any cases, does that limit the yeah. Um Up to now, our uh, development has only been limited by um, the TMDL process, by the Clean Water Act. So um, part of the Clean Water Act says you can't discharge additional pollutants into a water body that's already been declared impaired, unless the TMDL has already been implemented. So um, the states get around this with various ways, or they ignore that, um, but our state has an active NGO community, and they sued the state when they began to violate that part of the Clean Water Act, which most states do. And as a result, EPA kind of came in and reviewed our permitting and this, that, and the other, and said, you know, they're right. <laughs> you really can't be doing this. So um, we're trying to figure out how to um, uh, allow development, and it's probably going to be done through trading. So the way this, so this, this all started with a permit for a, a wastewater treatment plant. They wanted to add a wastewater treatment plant, but it was going to, the discharge was going to go into uh, an impaired water. So the downstream source of phosphorus, another wastewater treatment plant, it reduced its phosphorus load by X tons per year, and allowing that plant to still discharge and have the same amount of phosphorus causing impairment. It's a little slippery, but they're kind of using this sort of trading idea to allow development. But I think they're going to hit a ceiling. I mean, yeah, they can only yeah. go so far. So the Clean Water Act in its current uh, formulation um, will restrict development. And the more states that begin to see that this is happening, this this will be, um, it's not like we're the only state that has that problem. We just it, it got identified by our legal community. <laughs> so. I think locally the drainage commission here can influence development. It's interesting. Absolutely. And, and under the Clean Water Act, it really does limit development if you follow it to the letter of the law. Yes. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, one of the questions I think that you had you think your slide is there's a shift in the water sales from you know, surface water to ground water. What was the reason for that? Is it mainly a quantity? Is it just not having enough quantity? Or is it a quality? What drove that shift? So the, the Twin Cities is right, over, right around on either side, essentially, of the Mississippi River. Okay? So those cities, those immediate cities, always used uh, drinking water from the river, supplemented with groundwater if they needed to. As they moved out into the surrounding counties, they were much further away from the river. So they used groundwater. And then the cities themselves, um, they began to use more groundwater to supplement their surface water for reasons that aren't clear to me. I actually need to find out why they did that, but that was another choice that was being made. I think it had to do with the water quality. The Mississippi, uh, they were getting lots of t taste and odor issues around algae, and so they were, uh, um, I think they supplemented with groundwater because it was easier than cleaning the drinking water. So I think that's what they did, but I need to verify that with the managers of the system. But yes, it was mostly the expansion out to surrounding counties. Yeah. No doubt, our agriculture. Farmers need to be part of the solution. What's happening in Minnesota as far as getting farmers to that? Yeah, there's Nothing, a, there's, mm -hmm. the, no, there's the a couple of things. Systems, there's, yeah. a, there's a couple of things. So Minnesota aggressively pursued the adoption of BMPs. So they, they work with the farming community aggressively, one-on-one. -on -one. We have an active NRCS, but I mean, this is the actual state, the Department of Agriculture. Had, they had grants for um, controlled drainage infrastructures. You could get a matching grant to put in the structures and to, to do things like that. And so we have a very high adoption rate of BMPs. But 
you know, the old adage holds that, you know, 5% of the land is the, is the cause of 90% of the pollution. So you can have these BMPs adopted even at 50% and it may not fix the problem. So we're not seeing an improvement in water quality as a result of these BMP adoptions. That's one of our problems is the nitrate trends are getting worse even though the BMP adoption rate is increasing, and it's, it's like 40% of the farmers use some kind of BMP. We also are the pilot state for something called the water quality, Agricultural Water Quality Certification Program. And what that is, is basically, if farmers meet a certain bar um, based on some sort of objective process, they get certainty from future changes in the law for 10 years. And they like that because then they can get loans from the banks and, you know, they're not living in an uncertain world. Is EPA going to regulate? Is USDA going to do something different? So they are exempted from future changes in the law for 10 years if they meet these water quality standards. Those standards are essentially BMP-based, so they're, uh, they're not that strong. And it's a voluntary program. So, again, you get the good people the, the getting these certifications and doing the BMPs and getting the grants, but it may not be the farmers that you need to reach, the targeted land that is uh, causing most of the pollution problem. So um, I'd say we're struggling because we can't get the right land managed using voluntary programs. But we have all these programs. <laughs> are there real trust issues that are in the area? Oh, sure. I mean, uh, there's a lot of tension everywhere between the agricultural communities there's and the right. regulated communities. Our cities are in an uproar over the fact that they have stormwater rigs that they are having to meet and remove every last phosphorus molecule. Farmers sit there and say, we don't have to do anything. There's a lot of tension, More, not so much between the government and farmers, it's between the regulated communities and the non-regulated communities. That tension is building, and I think that's going to, to ultimately be a game changer because there's a lot of people in cities <laughs> and they ultimately have more votes and ultimately more control and they're getting really pissed off. So. Uh, actually I have a two. Uh, the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we already touched on it a little bit. You said uh, the control drainage is required in Minnesota. No, uh, we recommend it. We okay. recommend that it would be required. Okay, but but, but the state provides a kind of grants and uh, and it was supported. Right, right now we have a farmers. voluntary program where the state provides grants. It's okay. a matching grant. I think it's a one-to-one -one matching grant uh -huh. to put in a controlled drainage structures. But it's voluntary. You apply for the grant, um, and it's only something like five million dollars for a year. Okay, uh, how, so it's not much grant money. Okay, so how popular it is? I mean, is it our farmers are, um, our farmers. I mean, liking that idea. They, there are a lot of adopt. Adoptation. Yes, we have very high adoption rates. You know, the, the, the barrier there is um, not that they're opposed to um, BMPs, it's that they cost money. Right, yeah. Even to put in a berm or a, a, a we do require buffer strips, they're required in the state. Um, uh, but to put in even a, a drainage pond, or, you know, a reservoir to hold back drainage water, um, that costs money. And so um, the state is investing lots of money in matching grants incentives to, to do that. So the incentive would be this water quality thing where you get sort of, you know, certainty. The grants are to help pay for these actual BMP structures. Okay. So the second question is on the access of water and energy. And so uh, I'm, I'm curious about whether you know anything about hydrofracking in Minnesota. And if you do, and could you update us with that? Sure. So there are no shale reserves under the state of Minnesota. We're one of the states that has <coughs> fracking, which is good. Uh, the, the other, but we do play a major role, and that is that the, uh, the, the southeast corner of Minnesota and the southwest corner of Wisconsin are where all the sand, 90% of the sand comes from that's used in fracking. So the sand mining has um, gone up a factor of 10 to 20 in the last 10 years. So it's, it's gone up in order of magnitude. These sand uh, mines were mostly mom and pop things. They were just, you know, mining sand, selling it to you know, construction people. And all of a sudden, it's being used for fracking. Those communities are really, really struggling with the volume of sand that they want to mine. Permits are going out of control, and it's all, um, it's this is a land water thing. So it's all controlled by zoning commissions at the local community level, not even like the county level. This is way down at the, t the town level. And so they are overwhelmed with the problems that are being created of transportation and air pollution, water concerns, 
that's where the shallow aquifers are down there, so they're very concerned about that. The Mississippi and the wildlife refuges are downstream from there. So um, there's a lot of concern around the sand mining, and that's the connection to fracking. So, so that's the uh, Ottawa County in Minnesota? It's, a, it's a Wabasha County, and uh, there's a, like three or four different counties that are, are I don't know all the counties, but it's where Red Wing is, it's along Mississippi, Red Wing, the town of Red Wing, the town of Wabasha, and about 50 miles in, inland. Thank you. Thank you.